This presentation is delivered by the Stanford Center for Professional Development. Um, in some sense, that's not a very deep topic. Um, there's some kind of ideas as to how people organize word meaning, but in some sense the main result is that languages have a lot of words and you need to know their meanings to do anything useful in natural language processing. So it's sort of more important rather than having kind of deep analytical techniques. On the other hand, there are some quite interesting algorithms that have been developed um, to learn word meanings. So here's my um, warm-up question for my very small studio audience. Um, so the word pike, what, what meanings does the word pike have? Fish. Fish, it is a kind of fish, yep. A, a weapon, yeah. Cool. Um, yeah, so it's a kind of fish, so pike means a kind of fish and a kind of weapon. Um, it, the, Turnpike. Short for turnpike, yeah. So you can have the, um, what do you have? What's that pike that goes across New Jersey? Um, anyway, so it's a road. Um, any other meanings for the word pike? Okay, I did my homework before class. I bet there's at least one more meaning that you would recognize. Part of this shows how senses of words are very domain specific. Um, I'll give a hint. Um, it's coming up later this year in Beijing. In sport, at the Olympics, with a pike. Anyone watch the Olympics ever? <laughs> Wrong audience. Um, so in diving and in gymnastics, you have a pike as a kind of dive. People know that? Yeah, yeah. Some people have admitted that they do know that meaning. Um, um, as an Australian, it turns out that there's also an additional meaning of pike, which is used as a verb, which means to um, kind of um, whatever, kind of, withdraw and not follow through in doing things. People say something like, um, he was going to come for beer, but he piked, um, meaning that he you know, decided not to go. Um, but I don't expect you to know that one, but um, that again shows that often there are lots of um, dialectical and register uses of different words. Something that's also kind of vaguely interesting is just, well, how do all of these meanings come to be? I mean, it turns out that most of those meanings do actually have something to do with each other historically. So supposedly, the Oxford Dictionary tells me that the fish, the pike, was named after the weapon because it has a kind of a pointy head like the weapon, the pike. And, well, it turns out that the turnpike is kind of named after that sort of staff shape as well with roads, with when they let people into them, when they have those kind of turning things. So, that you know, there are kind of historical reasons often why words are related. Not always, sometimes they just come together by chance. Um, but that doesn't mean that the people who use these words know all of that historical stuff. And in fact, quite often what happens is that people um, will generate what are called folk etymologies where because things have the two name, they'll assume and has a story as to how the two things are connected where they may not actually have any um, connection. Okay, so, um, so I'll go on to talk about different word senses more, but let me just before I do that, um, just say quickly a couple of announcements which I'll also send email out about. So. Um, Final projects. So the final projects were um, officially due um, Wednesday at midnight. Now some people have already asked about whether you can have more time on and things like that. I guess the basic the, the basic answer is no. And the reason for that is 
Um, well, it turns out that for spring quarter especially, there's this really tight grading deadline um, to get things ready um, and graded before commencement, and there's just no chance that we could possibly do that um, when there are people that already have lots of late days left, um, unless we kind of essentially stick to that deadline. So I'm prepared to make one small concession for people who are out of late days, which is, I will say it is okay if you hand it in Thursday by 10 a.m., um, but I think really that's the limit of what we can do, because really, um, for Bijun, Paul, and me, unless we have some to grade before the weekend starts, um, there's no way that we'll be able to get through reading them all. Um, so then as well as handing in the final project, um, during the exam slot, we're going to have final project presentations. So they're going to be in this room, and they're scheduled for Monday morning. Um, so in our kindness and own desire to get some extra sleep, we're not actually going to start at 8.30. We're going to start at 9.30, and the plan is essentially that there'll be five minutes for each group to give their presentation. And I mean, in general, this has been um, quite a fun thing to actually see what different people have been working on and have been able to achieve. But it's also a mandatory thing that we expect at least one person and preferably all from each group um, to turn up to the, um, for the final presentations. And so for the nature of what to do, what we want is something that's very short, like um, five plus or minus one PowerPoint slides, or if you have a moral objection to using PowerPoint, you can make them an open office, and um, providing there's something we can use as slides. But what we would like to do is gather them all in advance, because the only thing, way that we can make things kind of run on time for a short presentation is to actually have them all running on one computer. So essentially, what you should be aiming to do is have an elevator pitch style presentation, where effectively there's a slide saying what's the problem that you're working on, there's a slide that says something about the methods that you used. There's a slide that shows some of the results that you have. And there should be a slide that has really concrete example stuff. I mean, it's very hard for people to get much of a sense of what you're doing if it's all completely abstract, whereas if you actually show some examples of what the input and output looks like, then that's sort of much more concrete and usable. And finally, on my third reminder, um, the gates are now open for you to do official evaluations of the course, and we do very much appreciate getting any feedback on what you thought of the course and how it could be better and things like that. So there's the official eval where um, they essentially bribe you to take part by only giving you access to your um, course results on an early date, providing you fill in the evaluation. Um, as well as that, I also really encourage you, if for either of the there are at least now two sites that kind of do unofficial public um, course commentary as well. So there's um, the www.stanfordcourses.com and then coursering.stanford.edu. Um, commentary on those is perhaps kind of easier and more pleasant and more public as well. Okay, those are all my announcements. And so I will go on. Okay, um, yeah, so lexical semantics. So it's, it's completely obvious that, you know, you, can't, you can have all of, we spend a fair while doing compositional semantics, and you can have all the clever compositional semantics that you want, but you can't actually do anything unless you actually know what words mean. And in fact, um, going from the other direction, many people would argue that for sort of practical natural language applications, that lexical semantics is largely where it's at, that most of what you need is knowing meanings of words and some of these subtle issues of how meanings combine are uh, sort of really either not so commonly needed or rather beyond the state of the art of our natural language applications anyway. Um, but, you know, that's tricky because Word meaning is all this messy stuff, that there are all of these words with all of these interesting meanings that we need to deal with. Now, one kind of ambiguity with words is they're part of speech. And that's normally handled separately by doing part of speech disambiguation. And we didn't spend a lot of time specifically on that, but implicitly, the parsers you guys built also did part of speech disambiguation. And some of the senses that I had a moment ago for Pike um, you could distinguish verb and noun senses. So my Australian, he piked, is a verb. And you can also use the infantry we weapon sense as a verb. You can say, 
Um, I piked him through the heart or something like that. Um, but even once you've gotten rid of um, word category ambiguity, which is normally easier to resolve, you're left with a lot of word sense ambiguity. Um, you know, here are some of the well-known examples of words with different senses. Bank, you can think of multiple senses of that. Score, games, music, etc. Right, direction, legal right, set, stock. Um, notice that those are all kind of short common words. Um, essentially, all, I mean, I'm sure there are exceptions, but essentially, all short common words have lots of word senses. Look them up in the dictionary and you'll find them. Um, in fact, um, that um, Ziff, who I mentioned briefly early on, he's got this one famous law that relates to um, a word's frequency and rank that I talked about. But it turns out that Ziff actually proposed lots of laws related to language. And another law that he proposed was that a word's number of senses should be related to its frequency. Um, okay, so we have this problem where words have lots of senses, and it seems like that affects and is part of a lot of the applications that we have. So everything from information retrieval to word to machine translation to natural language understanding, or we kind of need to know the senses of words. And then on the other hand, you also have the opposite problem, that in a lot of contexts, you can have different words that mean basically or exactly the same thing, so notebook or laptop, and that can be a problem for applications as well. And finally, you then also have these words um, that are spelt the same but um, pronounced differently. So for a word like B-A-S-S, -S, it can be pronounced either bass or bass with different meanings, um, fish is the bass. Um, and if you're going to do applications like speech synthesis, you then need to know what word sense is required to pronounce it correctly. Um, here's an example of a lexical entry for the word stock, which comes from Eldos. So Eldos was a pioneering dictionary that was done in the late 1980s in the, in the UK. And so Eldos was essentially the first dictionary that was created by people making electronic corpora and actually looking at what was found in the large corpus and arranging the dictionary based on appearance and frequency in a corpus. Eldos was also the first dictionary where the publishers were willing to make it available to researchers for less than a truly extortionate amount of money. And so if you go back in the history of computational linguistics, all of the early work with machine-readable dictionaries was done with Eldos. Um, so here we go, um, stock, a supply of something for use, a good stock of food, goods for sale, some of the stock is being taken without being paid for, the thick part of a tree trunk, a piece of wood used as a support or handle as for a gun or tool, the piece which goes right across the top of an anchor um, from side to side, a plant from which cuttings are grown, a stem onto which another plant is grafted, a group of animals used for breeding, farm animals, usually cattle, a family line, money lent to the government at a fixed rate of interest, the money owed by a, owned by a company divided into shares, a type of garden flower with a sweet smell, smell, a liquid made from the juices of meat bones. What? So, um, the first thing that you might take away from this and will um, discuss is, okay, well, word sense is disambiguation. That's a classification problem. We've got a word. It has a bunch of sensors. Um, we can try and do classification and assign words to those sensors. And indeed, that's what a ton of work has done. But I mean, you should actually take a moment to sort of look at these and just realize what a squidgy enterprise this is. So people who produce dictionaries take words if it's a modern corpus-based sense, they look at a bunch of examples of it in a corpus using a concordancing tool. And you know, even in the old days when Samuel Johnson was doing it, um, examples of usages of a word were co collected on index cards and people would look through them. And they effectively do a clustering task, right? This is human clustering in which they divide up those usages into some number of clusters and they stick them in the dictionary. 
But, you know, it's kind of a clustering task with fairly unclear principles and a fairly unclear right answer. And if you look at different dictionaries, you'll find that they group the senses of the same word quite differently. And you can see that here in terms of what's divided and um, what um, is being kept together. So, for example, if you take these first two senses, I mean, should they really be divided up as two senses? It sort of seems like there's at least half an argument that they're the same sense, that you have, a, you have a supply of something, and sometimes you have it sitting at home, and sometimes that you have it sitting in a store, but really that's the same meaning. I'd be game for that. A lot of the time what you find in dictionaries is if there's a particular kind, even if there's a reasonable case that is all one meaning, if there's a kind of a particular domain or context in which the word is especially commonly used, that will be differentiated out as a separate sense, even if it's really just kind of inside the circle of some other sense. And that's arguably what happens with 200. Um, then th 300 and 500 are making some subtle distinctions about plants as to whether you're distinguishing trunks of trees versus groups of plants. That one's kind of unclear too. Then we have this one here, where they're distinguishing, um, particularly whether you're using it for breeding or just the general sense in which you've got a supply of cattle. You can sort of see why people um, might want to distinguish that. Um, a bit squishy. Um, then you've got this idea of family line. I mean, then there's a question of, is this family line sense the same as the animals used for breeding and it's just we're talking about human beings or does it make sense to distinguish that sense. Um, so, you know, it sort of seems like there are some senses that are com clearly completely different from each other. So, you know, clearly the garden flower is um, different from the, the financial stock. We could all agree with that. Um, and, you know, but beyond that, it kind of gets into this sort of um, messy space of word senses. Okay. Um, Maybe I've sort of said most of that. Okay. Um, yeah, so I've sort of said some of this as well, but I'll just make this one distinction. So sometimes people distinguish between polysemy and homonymy, where homonymy is when you have two things, two lexemes, which are written the same, but just have nothing to do with each other, that they're just chance that the same word is used for two things. So the most famous example in the world of that, in the linguistics world, is bank. Side of a river, financial institution, got nothing to do with each other. They just happen to both be called bank. Um, and that's then distinguished from polysemy, where you have a word that has various senses of a meaning, but they're not completely unrelated to each other, they're somehow connected with each other. And so some of the senses for stock, I think we were seeing that. So the supply and the supply in a store, they seem to be related to each other. Some of these different senses with the cattle and the um, person's bloodline, they seem to be related to each other. And essentially, if you start looking at meanings, most of the cases where you get various meanings for words are in that second category. And that's because, as I mentioned in another class, that by and large, the way human language operates is people extend the meanings of the words by using metaphors. And so you have something like foot. Well, what can a foot be? If you look it up in the dictionary, um, it tells you it can be one of these things, but it'll also tell you another other meanings for a foot are things like the base of a mountain or the base of a column and things like that. Well, where do those other senses come from? They fairly transparently come from metaphorical uses where people are extending the notion of foot at the bottom of things to other uses. Um, and I won't go through the syntactic tests. Um, people have sometimes argued for a fairly strict distinction between homonymy and polysemy. I kind of suspect in practice it's hard to maintain, though there are certainly clear examples at both ends of the spectrum. Okay, and then in the opposite direction, um, we have synonymy. 
So the idea of synonyms when you learn it in school is that synonyms are pairs of words that have the same meaning, big, large synonyms. Um, the problem is if you actually get into the details of synonymy, there are almost no words that are truly synonyms. In fact, there are some people who've argued that there are no words that are truly synonyms. And so the idea of that is um, if you t look up um, Roger's thesaurus, best known listing of synonyms, that you'll find sets of words in the thesaurus like obliteration, erasure, cancellation, deletion. Well, they all do have something to do with each other, that's clear. They all have this sense of getting rid of something that was there. In some sense, they're synonyms. But if you then start thinking of some of the contexts in which you'd use those words and you start trying to substitute them, it basically doesn't work at all, right? So the flight was cancelled, um, and if you change that to the flight was obliterated, that sort of means something different. Um, the, flight, the flight was erased, um, not quite sure what that means. Um, the flight was deleted, that maybe is just about passable as a synonym for the flight was cancelled, but it's clearly not what, pe it's not what regular people say. Um, someone would look at you strangely if you said that the flight was deleted. Okay, so as well as having word sensors and synonyms, you can also think of words as being organized into a hierarchy or a taxonomy. Um, and the sort of standard representation, which, you know, old-fashioned computer scientists might think of as an is a hierarchy, gets called in lexical semantics as hypernyms and hypernyms, which are going in opposite directions in a lexical hierarchy. So um, cars are kind of vehicle, dogs are kind of animal, um, etc. Okay. Um, traditionally, this wasn't information that was represented in dictionaries, that dictionaries commonly have listed senses of words and synonyms of words. But traditionally, they haven't listed this as a kind of information. Now, that's something that's been addressed more recently. Okay, so if we think of our lexicon and draw some pictures, um, something I haven't mentioned so far is people normally make a distinction between word forms and lexemes. So word forms are particular inflectional forms of a word, runs, running, or here, eat, eats, ate, eaten, and then that's contrast of the lexeme, which is kind of a base form of a word that you put in a dictionary. Normally you don't put word forms in a dictionary. And then a lexeme can have various senses as we've discussed. And then um, so sometimes that you want to say that one word form then has multiple lexemes. The clearest cases are words that have nothing to do with each other um, but can c come together in the same lexeme. So something like um, the bass um, tone versus the, the bass fish. Um, there would be two lexemes, although they're the same word string. And then over here, we have the senses for words. And so normally, one lexeme will have multiple senses. And so when people think of synonymy, really synonymy is best represented as two words sharing one sense. Because commonly, these words will have other senses as well that aren't shared. Okay, if you're, if you're a computational linguist, and you want to do lexical semantics, and you're not working for a rich company, by and large, what everyone uses is WordNet. I mean, even if you are working for a rich company, by and large, everybody uses WordNet um, because it's freely available, no licensing restrictions, no hassles. Um, so it was built um, at the University of Princeton. Um, WordNet was originally sponsored by George Miller, who's an extremely famous psycholinguist. So George Miller um, is now a very old guy, um, but he's worked in psycholinguistics since back into the 50s. So he's essentially a contemporary of Chomsky's. And indeed, in some early stuff, they collaborated together, though um, their paths have kind of diverged. So um, when George Miller started off the WordNet project, 
he was really interested in it from a psycholinguistic perspective. He wanted to come up with a new lexical representation which was more in accord with how words are organized and stored in the brain. Um, I think in practice, as time has gone by, that motivation has been largely lost, except in a very, very loose sense that WordNet does contain more network of words, and you might think that that somehow feels a little bit more like how your brain organizes information. Um, but um, nevertheless, it's sort of the main online free lexical organization. And it follows the organization that I just mentioned. So it keeps parts of speech separate, which was claimed to be supported by psycholinguistic research. And then inside each part of speech, you have this organization where you have lexemes that belong to various synsets, where the synsets are the senses that I showed on the previous page. Um, a little quirk of WordNet is it has no coverage whatsoever of closed class parts of speech. It only does nouns, verbs, adjectives, and adverbs, which is occasionally annoying, because sometimes you'd like to know about things like prepositions that have similar meaning. OK, so very quickly, I'll just sort of show you a few stats on WordNet. So the noun database has about 90,000 lexemes, a few more than that sensors. And it has a kind of a rich set of links. So it has hyphenims, hyphenims, has member, has part, antonyms, and actually some additional stuff. Um, and so in the organization, when you have these synsets, the synsets are effectively groupings of words which are claimed to have one sense in common. So chump, fish, fool, gull, mark, patsy, fall guy, sucker, um, etc. You know, many of these words have many other senses, such as fish, um, but they're claimed, I'm not really familiar with this sense of the word fish, I confess, but they're claimed to all have um, this sense of somebody being a sucker. Okay, so if you look at WordNet, um, this is probably too small to really read, but you can kind of walk up this hyphenum hierarchy. So here we start off with a robin, and a robin is placed under thrush, which is placed on, under various kinds of sub-kinds of birds that I've never heard of, where you get to bird, and then you go up various kinds of things until you get to animal, then you go to organism, living thing, object, physical, entity, physical. So you kind of go up to one of a small number of roots of the hierarchy. And so in general, the organization of nouns is very elaborate, and in areas like natural kinds like this, it's especially elaborate and stores tons of stuff that actually regular human beings don't actually know. They've had too many biologist interns filling it in. Um, and you can ask questions of the interface, so you can ask for um, parts of things. OK, when you go to verbs and adjectives and adverbs, the structure isn't as rich. So the number of verbs is just much smaller. That's just a fact of English, that they're kind of only about 10,000 verbs in English. There aren't a huge number like nouns. But the organization you get is you still get hyponyms. Um, you get kind of related things, um, walk, stroll. You have entailment relationships and antonyms. And then for adjectives and adverbs, you basically only have antonyms in the organization. OK, so WordNet's online. You can play with it online. Um, you can download it. And that's my um, tour of lexical organization. And so for the rest of the time, I then want to talk about some of the things that people do in the domain of computational lexical semantics. And the thing I'll spend most time on is word sense disambiguation of trying to find out the senses of words. But then I'll spend a bit of time at the end talking about word sense, working out word sense similarity and other fun things you can do in lexical semantics. OK, so the task of word sense disambiguation is to find out what sense of a word is intended by the context in which it's used. So if we take these examples here, the seed companies cut off the tassels of each plant, making it male sterile. There, a plant is a living green thing. Um, Nissan's Tennessee manufacturing plant beat back a United Auto Worker, Workers organizing effort. Um, their plant is in the sense of industrial factory. Um, and 
well, you can sort of see here already um, what we need to do. We need to do this categorization task to work out which sense is intended in context um, to help with various applications. And what kind of information can we use? Well, one source of information we could hope to use is just prior information. And if you're kind of naive and think um, plant, that means a green thing most of the time, well, that's a form of prior information. It turns out that if you're getting your sentences from Newswire, as these sentences are, that's actually the wrong prior. If you look in Newswire, it's far, far more common that you actually get examples of this um, industrial plant sense than leafy green things. But then the other source of information is, well, kind of looking around you. Manufacturing plant, um, that's suggestive. Um, seed companies, tassels, that's suggesting something. So we should be able to use the context to be able to do things. And normally, this has been done as a categorization task, which is a supervised learning task. It's also sometimes done as an unsupervised clustering task. And normally, if you're doing that, you're settling with just doing a kind of a word sense clumping. OK, um, I'll take a quick detour into the history of the early days of word sense disambiguation, which is kind of a little bit interesting. Um, so the same Warren Weaver who I quoted before as initiating all the work in word sense disambiguation, he immediately noted um, that word senses are going to be a problem for machine translation. So he noted, a word can often only be translated if you know the specific sense intended. A bill in English could be a pico or a cuenta in Spanish. And so then in the early days of machine translation, one of the very prominent people in work in machine translation was Joshua Bar Hillel. And Joshua Bar Hillel actually focused in on this problem of word sense disambiguation. And he posed the following problem. Look at this little text. It's really a toy text. Little John was looking for his toy box. Finally, he found it. The box was in the pen. John was very happy. Where it's focusing on the ambiguity of pen, um, meaning is it the writing implement of pen or a pen for having kids in, which I think is not a very current usage. People normally. Um, People still put, put walls around their children to keep them in certain parts of the house, but I think these days they don't generally refer to it as a pen. Um, but anyway, um, um, Bahalel essentially declared um, that this task of working out which sense of pen um, was in use in this context, which would be required in most cases so that you could translate correctly into another language, um, was an unsolvable problem. And he was so convinced it was an unsolvable problem that he left the field of machine translation and went off and did mathematics. Um, so, um, so what he writes is, assume for simplicity's sake that pen in English has only the following two meanings, a certain writing utensil of the enclosure. I now claim that no existing or imaginable program will enable an electronic computer to determine the word pen in the given sentence within the given context as the second of the above meanings, whereas every reader with a sufficient knowledge of English will do this automatically. So a lot of recent work um, has in statistical NLP has essentially argued, ah, this Bartholel guy, he was a bit crazy. Um, we can just kind of slurp up a lot of text and look in the context of, which, of words, and we can work out the senses of words perfectly well. And I'll show you some of the results there that um, later that go along with substantiating um, that um, position. But I was actually doing some, doing some historical reading the other month. And you know, Bahalel wasn't a dope. Um, it's not that he couldn't think of the fact that people could use such methods. I mean, the real argument he makes, if you actually look into the details of what he wrote, was actually rather more subtle than that. And he quite acknowledges the fact that a lot of the time, methods of that general ilk um, would work. So what he actually then writes in more detail is, um, 
let me state rather dogmatically that there exists at this moment no method of reducing the polysemy of the, say, 20 words of an average Russian sentence in a scientific article below a remainder of, I would estimate, at least five or six words with multiple English renderings, which would not seriously endanger the quality of the machine output. Many tend to believe that by reducing the number of initially possible renderings of a 20-word Russian sentence from a few tens of thousands, which is the approximate number resulting from the assumption that each of the 20 Russian words has two renderings on the average, while seven or eight of them might have only one rendering, to some 80, which would be the number of renderings on the assumption that 16 words are uniquely rendered and four have three renderings apiece. Um, the main bulk of this kind of work has been achieved the remainder requiring only some slight additional effort. Um, and Bahalel then goes on to argue um, that the problem is no. There are a bunch of easy cases you can do, but there are these residue of hard cases, and he can't see how automatic methods um, will be able to get them right. Um, and really, if you look at the current state of the art of um, statistical empirical methods and NLP, they're really kind of at the level that Bahalel's talking about, that yeah, about three quarters of the words, you can do a good job, and you can work out what senses intended in context, but really the rest of them people still can't get right. Um, and this is actually one of the reasons why in practice word sense disambiguation hasn't had as much effect on applications as you'd initially believe it would, is because it's actually hard to get a residue of senses right. Okay, but nevertheless, um, in the history of NLP, um, in the early days of NLP, this was one of the many problems that people tried to approach um, with deep AI. So essentially, people built expert systems whose job it was to determine the senses of the word. Um, Small and Riga um, have the dubious distinction of building such an expert system, and they are often pilloried in modern statistical um, NLP writings because they were so unwise as to write. Um, the word expert for throw is currently six pages long. That's six pages of Lisp code, um, but should be 10 times that size. Okay, um, so compared to that, then when statistical methods came along, they showed great promise because they gave the opportunity of providing you had some supervised training data that you could do automatic disambiguation with high success. And so the alternative approach of the statistical NLP, the um, quotation that's most not commonly referred to is this work of Firth. So Firth was a British linguist in the 30s and 40s whose work is actually very little known in the United States, but has been kind of picked up by statistical NLP people for saying, you shall know a word by the company it keeps. I actually also rather like um, Wittgenstein's later writings that relate to this point. And he writes, you say the point isn't the word, but it's meaning. And you think of the meaning as a thing of the same kind as the word, though also different from the word. Here the word, there the meaning. The money and the cow that you can buy with it. But contrast money and its use. Well, I don't actually know what that means. But in another passage, he says something more understandable. Um, he says, for a large class of cases, though not for all, in which we employ the word meaning, it can be defined thus. The meaning of a word is its use in the language. And so Wittgenstein, in his later writings, is attributed with advocating for this position of a use theory of meaning, where the representation of a meaning of a word is just the context in which it appears. And the knowledge of the meaning of a word, meaning that you know um, which context, you know, effectively you do a closed task, if you've seen that in psychology, that you can correctly say whether a word is, a, is appropriate in a particular context or not. Okay, so if you're... If you're going to do supervised um, word sense disambiguation, you need some training data to use. And so these are just some of the training data that's out there. Um, SEMCOR is perhaps the largest contiguously annotated collection. So it's part of the brown corpus with all words that are in WordNet, i.e. all content words annotated to sensors. There's a smaller um, DSO corpus from Singapore that's similar. And then there, I'll say more about SenseVal later, where they've evaluated various both lexical samples and continuous text for sensors. 
Of course, like a lot of these things, there's a small amount of annotated data, and then there are humongous amounts of unannotated data. And so that's why a lot of people are interested in how can you use more unsupervised methods. Um, so this is kind of what you get in SEMCore. So this is a boring piece of construction text um, that's talking about um, something uh, slipped into place across the roof beams, and it's giving the sense of words like slip place roof beams in terms of WordNet sensors. Um, so how can you do um, word sense disambiguation? One kind of approach that doesn't require supervised data that I should just briefly mention is using dictionaries. And the method that's most commonly cited is Lesk's method. Um, this is Mike Lesk, who you might know from other contexts like information retrieval and digital libraries. Um, so the Lesk algorithm was essentially that you get definitions from a dictionary and you use a word overlap measure in the definitions and use that to attribute sensors. So suppose I want to disambiguate the words pine cone. Um, I can look up pine. It has two sensors, kind of evergreen tree with needle-shaped leaves and waste away through sorrow or illness. And cone has the mathematical sense something of this shape, fruit of certain evergreen trees. I can just look at those two sensors, and at least if I've reduced them to lemmas, I chopped off the plural ending, I can see, look, sense one of pine and sense three of cone, they overlap in the words evergreen tree, and therefore I will disambiguate both words successfully. Um, another huge source of information is just to go with frequency. I mean, notwithstanding what I said about the different senses of plant and priors being potentially misleading, it turns out that for most words, at least relative to a particular um, text type, that their usage is just extremely, extremely skewed. Right? So a word like cell with a C, C-E-L-L, -L, has a bunch of different meanings, but if you're reading any biology journal, boy, is it skewed what sense that you're going to get. If you're reading Newswire, the word plant is extremely skewed. It's about 10 to 1 what sense you're going to get. Um, so if you can just use what is the most common sense in the genre, that's a very, very strong source of information. And a particular instance of this um, is what you see in a lot of the literature is the WordNet first sense heuristic. So in general, the senses of WordNet and their ordering don't mean anything in particular, but there's been an effort in WordNet to put first the most common sense of a word in some kind of generic, non-domain specific um, sense. And it turns out that if you're dealing with rare words for which you have very little training data, which is a lot of words most of the time, that this WordNet first sense heuristic turns out to be just a very strong baseline. That's very hard to outperform it. So that there are many word sense disambiguation systems which essentially work on a system like if you have more than, say, six, ten training examples, you try and train a classifier. If you have less than that, you just go with the word sense first sense heuristic. Um, but clearly, if we want to do better than that, we want to use context, like in my examples for plant, to differentiate what's um, correct. And there are various senses of context. There's a traditional linguistic sense of context, which I'll just mention quickly, which is selectional restrictions. This is the kind of technology that was used a lot in things like Small and Riga's AI-based um, word experts. Um, so the idea is that you have nouns that are connected together with verbs, and verbs for their different senses have selectional restrictions. So eating the things that you eat are a food stuff, driving the things that you drive are vehicles, and so if you see sentences like which airlines serve breakfast, you know that breakfast is a kind of food, so that must be the sense of serve of handing over food, whereas if you say, see which airlines serve Denver, you know that Denver is a city, and so that means it must be the sense of serve that there are roots to it. So you can disambiguate both nouns and verbs in that way. Um, it's often very hard to get much mileage from that for all sorts of reasons. One of the reasons why 
fairly deterministic methods of doing this, like these expert systems fail, is that there are all sorts of creative usages. So in his two championship trials, Mr. Kulkarni ate glass on an empty stomach, accompanied only by water and tea. Um, well, there's someone eating something that wouldn't normally be called a foodstuff. Um, but, you know, classic... A lot of the information you have isn't classical selection or restrictions. Commonly, if you just know the topic of the article, that's worth a lot to you. Um, and so that led to kind of modern statistical work in computational linguistics. In the starting off of um, statistical methods and computational linguistics, there are essentially two key endeavors. One was the machine translation work that started at IBM and the other of which was work done at AT&T Labs, largely led by Ken Church. And essentially where they started is doing word sense disambiguation. But actually they were doing word sense disambiguation for the purposes of machine translation. And so the method that they used was naive Bayes classifiers, which at that time counted as sort of something very new for most of the computational linguistic AI community. So you have a prior probability of a sense um, and then you have um, the probability of a context given the sense, and the context probability is just being estimated by taking the probability of different words occurring in that context, where the words are just being modeled as a bag of words. So you've got some context window, and you're just generating all the words in that context as a multinomial classifier. Um, so, I mean, actually, yeah, their application was machine translation as well. And so uh, one clever way of getting training data for word sense disambiguation, which is also application relevant, is actually to use parallel data. Because if you're doing MT, you want to learn about word senses that get translated differently, and you don't really need to learn about word senses that don't get translated differently. And so they were taking English words that have different translations in French. So here's drug. It's two translations of the sort of the good medical, well, I'm not sure how you want to define them, illicit drugs, illicit drugs. Um, and then you're kind of, they're getting examples based on how it was translated. Um, okay, and so they can learn good clues for the different senses of drug in English. That's kind of what you think if you see words like prices and patent and consumer. That's the medication. If you see words like paraphernalia, trafficking, that's the illegal substance. Um, so people were extremely, extremely impressed because they um, showed ex just extremely good results um, from doing this for these kind of word sensors. So results of over 90% accuracy. But an important thing to notice is that um, these results are for distinguishing two extremely distinct senses of a word. Now, in some sense, um, you might say, well, actually, this is the main task um, that I want to deal with. I'm not really interested in some of those fine-grained sensors. I only want to know about core sensors of things that translate differently that are really important. And I think the answer is that you in a lot of cases, for those kind of cases, you can get high accuracies in word sense disambiguation. Nevertheless, the funny thing that's happened in word sense disambiguation is a lot of more recent work has shifted to looking at much more fine-grained sensors of the kind found in places like WordNet. And so the accuracy has then kind of gone south. Because if you're trying to distinguish 10 different sensors of the word stock of the kind that we saw beforehand, some of which are very similar to each other, that's a way more difficult task, and you get much worse results. Okay, there's been a ton of um, other work um, on word sense disambiguation, including um, bootstrapping methods to reduce data. Um, I won't go through that in detail. I'll just mention a couple of things down the bottom here. Um, these were two principles suggested by David Urowski. Um, these two are kind of related, so I'll do this one first. One sense per discourse was his claim that in general in a discourse, say a piece of text, an article or something, you'll only find one sense of a word. A lot of the time that's true. If an article is using a word in one sense, 
it just won't use it in any other senses. Um, later work has refined that claim a little. I think commonly what you find is this is true for noun senses. It isn't true for verb senses, that articles can easily use verbs in different senses. One sense per collocation kind of connects up um, with this general notion of collocations. So um, Gale and Church did everything just with these bag of words features. But I think modern understanding is that as well as having these kind of broad topical features, it's just really useful to have specific features that says what is the word to the left and what is the word to the right. And often people also look at the second word to the left and the second word to the right because it just turns out um, that there are a lot of very particular collocations that choose one sense. So you'll have an expression like laughing stock. And well, if you just see the word laughing to the left of the word stock, it's always going to be this one particular sense. And you know, if you kind of start paying attention to all these context words, well, there might just be too many words about plants or who knows what in a particular um, text, and they'll only confuse you and get it wrong. And so by and large, if there's a clear collocation, it nearly always chooses the same sense. And so you also want to pay a lot of attention to that close by collocational information. Um, rush ahead. Um, right, so baselines for word sense disambiguation. Commonly, people use most frequent sense. Sometimes people regard less method as a baseline. Upper bound, how much humans agree. Um, so rigorous evaluation of word sense disambiguation for these sort of many subtle senses has taken place in sense of our. So the task for a sense of our one is taking a word like horse and distinguishing by, between a whole bunch of senses, all the ones listed in sense of our. People have done that both for all words and for lexical sample. I'll just show you the lexical sample results. So the lexical sample results are essentially on difficult words that have many senses. So average number of senses in WordNet for the words that were tested was nine. So that's kind of um, these subtle many sense in WordNet words. But often many of those senses are related together and hard to tell apart. So these are the kind of results you get. Um, you probably can't read it well, but down here it says Stanford CS224N because um, many years ago we used to use word sense disambiguation as one of the projects. Um, and then um, me and a couple of others took all the um, CS224N WordNet's word sense disambiguation systems and tied them together into a classifier combination and entered into sense of our. And we actually did pretty well because we ended up coming to fourth place doing that. Um, the main subtlety in the work was in the classifier combination because it turns out that not all the students' systems were as good as others. And so rather than it being kind of standard bagging and boosting methods where you assume that your base level classifiers um, were uh, sort of of the same general standard. Um, a lot of the art here was working out which student systems um, to not use um, for judging particular words. Um, so the final system used between three and 11 student systems depending on the word. Um, but I digress. Um, so the best performance here um, was 64% um, accuracy and Stanford was doing 61.7, close to that. Um, so, you know, the positive result there is how state of the art the systems that we produce in CS224N are. Um, but the negative result is, in some sense, at least for this task of trying to recover WordNet sensors, it's really, really difficult and people can't do it. But I think many people now believe that this just is too hard a task and a kind of an uninteresting one because a lot of those fine senses might not matter much. Okay, so then let me go on and um, touch a couple of other topics. So, I mean, there's been lots of interest in lexical acquisition of how can we then kind of acquire something about the meaning of words. And one way of understanding word similarity is again to go straight to our thesaurus. We could go to WordNet and say, well, can we work out meaning similarity in that? 
And I think I'll kind of quickly skip past that. But the general idea is if you have an ISA hierarchy, um, here's part of the ISA hierarchy from WordNet, we should be able to tell that words are similar. So nickel and dime should be similar. Nickel and coin and dime are similar. That we have this kind of similarity measure. And people have defined a whole bunch of similar word sense similarity measures over WordNet, and they're quite widely used for many tasks. Um, but there are lots of problems with that. One of the biggest problems is coverage. Lots of stuff you just won't find in WordNet. And so here's some kind of a list of words you don't find in WordNet. Okay, so an alternative is to come up with a representation of word meaning and word similarity that you can induce much more automatically. And so this leads into the area of vector space-based lexical semantics. There isn't only vector space-based lexical semantics. There's also been quite a bit of recent work in doing um, probability simplex-based lexical semantics. But for what I'll say today, I'll just say a little bit about vector space-based lexical semantics. In some sense, this is an old idea that goes back into linguistics as well, that there's been this kind of idea of having word features, which is referred to as comp componential semantics. So you can have various vector dimensions, and then you can say, well, dog is animate, what it eats meat, it's social, horses are animate, but eat grass and social, that you can then have similarity inside this kind of binary vector between different words. And in some sense, what people do with vector-based lexical semantics is like that, but more quantitative. Okay, so the general picture for vector-based lexical semantics is um, you have some properties which are normally distributional properties, so you can learn it unsupervised from a lot of data. Um, you turn each word into a vector, and then if you only want to do word similarity, you just use those vectors for word similarity. And if you want to create clusters of words, you then perform some kind of clustering. Okay. Um, and one of the interesting things is there's then been quite a lot of psycholinguistic work that's then picked up on some of these distributionally specified lexical similarity measures. And there's actually kind of quite good support in general can be found between what you can find by defining lexical similarities over a lot of text in a kind of meaning as use sense and what you find from human experiments on lexical similarity. Okay, so um, the most standard thing, this is kind of um, word association 101, but actually works very well and is in a sense the basis of what most people use, is that you define the meaning of a word just as Wittgenstein or Firth said by the company it keeps. So you make a big matrix of words versus words and you count, oh, you count the number of times um, that a word occurs in the context of another word where context has some meaning which like word sense disambiguation can be the, the window of a word. So you kind of go through sentences or ten word on each side windows and every time a word co-occurs with another word you put entries into this um, co-occurrence matrix. And so that then gives vectors for each word and so that you could hope to see that banana and apple are kind of similar from each other because they co-occur with John and eight and they don't co-occur with drove. Um, and so there are the kind of obvious parameters of how big your window is. Do you weight words with something like TFIDF scaling? Do you use dimensionality reduction methods, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera? Um, some people have worked with doing finer grain methods, um, where rather than just using all words as a context, you use kind of particular words for context, and so. The commonest case is using some syntactic structure and grammatical dependencies and using those to define the context. And sometimes using only very particular grammatical dependencies. So one thread of work used only modifiers to represent the meaning of words. So here you have Soviet cosmonaut and spacewalking cosmonaut, spacewalking astronaut, um, a red car, a red truck, 
a full moon. It actually turns out to be kind of interesting if you just use adjectives, because effectively adjectives by and large represent qualities of things that are unchanging. And so you get this sense of similarity in sort of sharing unchanging qualities. And so that this sense tends to be more like the original componential semantic sense. Whereas some of the other ways of just using arbitrary um, context, words become similar if they're used in the same context. And whether that's good or bad depends on what your application is. So if you just use the entire distribution of words, things that occur together become similar. So you know, if you have baseball articles, you'll have um, bat and ball and stadium and crowd and hamburger. All of these words will become similar because they're used in context where people are talking about baseball games. Whereas if you restrict in some way, like only using adjectives, you're then only getting similarity in much more specific senses. Okay, so once you have some word vectors, um, you can use similarity measures. The traditional ones are using cosine or Euclidean distance, which is equivalent, um, providing you're normalizing your vectors to be unit vectors. There's then been some threads of work which actually suggest that you don't do as well with these measures, and you do better with measures such as an L1 measure or some of the various probabilistic measures that have been used. I mean, the sense of that seems to be that the kind of squaring operations that you're using in these measures don't actually make terribly much sense if you're thinking about word count data and that you're doing better with something like an L1 metric. Okay, um, so here's just an example of the kind of results you get out of that. So this is um, the Burgess and Lund model, which was used for psycholinguistic purposes. Um, you know, 160 million word corpus. Um, context from 70,000 most frequently occurring words. It's commonly the case when people build these models that for counting things in the context, you only use some number of common words. I mean, that's just kind of a crude way of stopping your matrix getting too huge, and in practice doesn't really affect accuracy, because unless you've seen a word a bunch of times, it's not really very useful as a context clue. Um, cosine, 10 word window. and I mean, they're kind of pretty good, the lists they get out. So frightened. So this is saying for the word before the colon, what are the most similar words to it? So scared, upset, shy, embarrassed, anxious, worried, afraid, harmed, abused, forced, treated, discriminated, allowed, um, Beatles, original band, song, movie, album, songs, lyrics, British. Um, this is typical for what you get from distributional similarity, right? The, this is kind of all good as topically associated with Beatles. This is just general distributional similarity. Um, the word most similar to frightened is scared. That's good. But then a the couple after that kind of aren't quite so good, right? Upset and shy don't seem, I mean, they're kind of emotions that are negative, but they're not so similar um, to frightened. And it seems like really you'd be better off if you could have gotten afraid and anxious and worried higher up the list. Um, so it works reasonably, but it's hard to get results that are perfect. Another very, very, very well-known form of doing this distributional similarity is um, Landau et al.'s latent semantic analysis, which is then using SVD to do dimensionality reduction of your vector um, and then doing similarity in the reduced space. And the claim is, and I think the claim is um, somewhat true, um, Landau sometimes makes some very, very strong claims for LSA, which I think aren't really true. But the, a weak claim that you commonly can get some mileage from doing dimensionality reduction in measuring word similarity, I think is true. OK. Um, OK. Um, so that's a kind of a general method of sort of just taking this sort of soup of words and working out word similarity. Um, before time runs out, I thought I'd then just sort of say something about a rather different way of doing un sort of unsupervised. It's, it's, 
It's the sort of learning that you can do over large amounts of text at any rate um, that has also been explored, including by a st student at Stanford, Ryan Snow, which is trying to do a much more specific form of learning over large amounts of text. Um, and so the idea here is what we want to no learn is about new hypernyms, so new is a kind of links. And the motivation for this is, you know, we can't just use WordNet for our is a kind of links because it just doesn't have very good coverage when it comes down to it. So if you sort of look at something like these normalizations, like custom, uh, the ability net normalizations, that some of them are in WordNet, combustibility and navigability, but other ones like affordability, reusability, and extensibility aren't in WordNet. And th those are words that everyone knows. So can we learn hypernym relationships automatically? And this was um, a field that was essentially pioneered by Marty Hurst, who's at Berkeley. And what her observation was is that there are just lots of sentences that ex essentially tell you hypernym relationships. So rather than trying to do some very, very clever form of distributional similarity with some kind of statistical filtering and getting high quality re results from that, why don't we instead go for a high precision approach and run it over vast amounts of text and essentially just look for the sentences that tell us about hypernym relationships or tell us about synonym relationships. And there are lots. So here's the sentence. Agar is a substance prepared from a mixture of red algae such as galidium for laboratory or industrial use. Well, what is galidium? It's a kind of red algae. How do we know that? Well, the sentence tells us um, with a such as phrase that galidium is a kind of red algae. So maybe we should just look for those sentences. And so what Hurst did was um, just hand wrote patterns that would find examples of those things. NP0 such as NP1, NP2, and or NPI, um, those are hypernyms. Um, and so she wrote a handful of regular expressions. Um, I seem to only have five on this list, but I remember there are six um, that were kind of obvious um, ones. So there's X, Y, and other um, things. So temples, treasuries, and other important civic buildings. The such as ones, um, including all common law countries, including Canada and England, um, and especially um, animals, especially cats and dogs. And so she ran that over a lot of text and learned patterns quite successfully. So more recently, um, Ryan Snow has been trying to do that in a less hand-specified, more machine learning-based way. So what he's doing is passing up sentences to give dependency parsers like this, and then potentially saying any path in the dependency parse could be a pattern for learning examples of things. So if I have a pattern like this one between oxygen and element, that's a potential pattern. And this pattern between abundant and oxygen, that's a potential pattern. And I want to learn patterns that are good indicators of things being a hypernym. And well, how will I bootstrap this? I'll bootstrap this by using known hypernyms from WordNet, and then I'll try and acquire other hypernyms. And so he can represent the kind of patterns that Hurst had effectively by paths through dependency graphs. So um, y such as x, you'll have the y, and then you'll have the such as prepositional relationship leading to the x. Um, okay, so this is the details of their algorithm. So they collect a huge number of noun pairs. They find positive and negative examples of them being hypernyms using WordNet. Um, they parse them all. They train a hypernym classifier. Um, um, turn them into a logistic regression with plus and minuses um, for whether they're good patterns or not. And so they um, discover a whole bunch of patterns. So um, here's a cold pattern. Heavy water rich in the doubly heavy hydrogen atom called deuterium. Um, 
is a new one and a condition called something. So in total, you know, they define 70,000 patterns um, that are automatically defined. And the question then is how good are these patterns? And um, that's the graph over here. So um, this is um, a recall of how applicable the pattern is. And then this is the precision, which is of all the times the pattern matched, how often was it a real hypernym relationship? And the kind of interesting thing is um, that these red marks show the patterns that were the hand-specified Marty Hurst patterns. Um, so Marty Hurst, she thought through it correctly, or maybe did a little bit of corpus research. So essentially, I mean, Marty Hurst um, found all the best patterns that were the kind of the highest F measure patterns of having reasonable precision and recall. She also had one pattern that was a bit of a dud, um, but that was pretty good going um, when it comes down to it of having seven of seven of her patterns were really the sort of seven things that are highest out on the precision recall curve. But the interesting thing is that there are a bunch of other patterns. So she didn't have an appositive pattern, but that pattern is a reasonably high precision and recall pattern. And perhaps actually even most interestingly, it seems like, like there are a whole bunch of patterns down here which are very low recall, but they're high precision patterns. So if you can actually have all of those patterns, um, then that can give you a substantial increase in your ability to learn good patterns. Okay. Um, I did have three slides on one more topic, but I think maybe I'll say that's it for, um, it's a cute other example if you want to look at it, but I think I'll call it the end for the day and say that's my tour of lexical semantics. And so then there's the one more lecture on um, Wednesday, which talks about question answering systems.